Uh, I wanted to start today with Lan O'Brien. Um, here's a letter to the editor, uh, the letter to the editor's page on April the 23rd, 1986 in the Irish Times. It's an unusual day for the letters to the editor page because a photograph was featured. Typically there are letters without images shown there. And here's a particular instance that's been very important for me to find out about and think about over the last 20 years or so. Um, it's an unofficial monument that um, was erected on the highest point in Ireland, the closest point in Ireland to heaven, uh, Karen Tuhill Mountain uh, in 1983. Uh, it's a bicycle on top of an iron mast that was there one time to fuel an electric um, turbine to light up the crucifix that you see behind you that was erected there in the Marian year 1954, right? Um, and for me, it's a, it's a monument to Flann O'Brien and uh, his book, The Third Policeman, that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. And um, there's a kind of very important moment here about this bicycle and the kind of drudgery of cycling a bicycle every day that Flann O'Brien captures so much in the book. And also the fantastical nature of a bicycle on the top of the highest mountain in the country, uh, all of it coming together, the drudgery and the fantastic to usurp the Christian hierarchy behind there. Um, Boyce was given a copy of um, The Third Placement by Dorothy Walker during a visit here in the 1970s. And it influenced him to uh, make his final performance that happened in Naples in Italy in 1985 called Is It About a Bicycle, which is a direct quote from the book. Um, and I wanted to show this image to start off with because I wanted to try and make a, I suppose, a kind of polarity a little bit about some of the material that I'm going to show today, which is to suggest that a lot of the Boycean thought is so fantastical in its own idiom. And the notion of radicalizing our everyday and having a political revolution through that, that affects ourselves, our communities, and the world at large. Um, these are all amazing things to dwell on and of course are part of his enigma. Um, but at the same time, there's the daily drudgery of trying to enact those situations and getting caught into scenarios that bring the revolution down, you know? Um, and somehow that's about the vernacularism of everyday life, the conversations we have, the ways we share information with each other. And I'm gonna show a kind of collection of material and a couple of artworks that were produced out of that in around 2007 and 2008 that kind of riff between those two situations a little bit in terms of how I've gone back and analyzed th that time in terms of my own research practice and uh, also realizing a lot of other artists who are interested in this situation and trying to share things along, you know? So uh, I'm gonna go to Shelley Sachs who, ran a very good teaching program in Oxford uh, Brooks University uh, for a good few years, thinking about Joseph Boyce and how that would work in terms of student curriculum. And I think the definition she gave in Mia Lerma Hayes' book uh, a couple of years ago um, is worth bearing out here. Um, so what, what, what's this fuss about? Um, strategies for coming closer to our own lives and the world around us, listening and hearing strategies, strategies for uncovering agendas, for shifting attention, strategies for encountering our values, our attitudes, strategies for entering what is difficult and for discovering what each person feels need, needs addressed. Such strategies are a basis for uncovering intentions and motivations that are our own. They are a basis for working from inner necessity. So that's a very bold statement and something I think would be carried out in a lot of Boisean legacy and within his own thought patterns as well, I'm sure you'll agree. Here's the kind of day-to-day -day reality of trying to enact that. 
This is about a little bit before six o'clock in the evening in Limerick on September the 26th, 1974. Uh, here's Boyce uh, after arriving into the city to present not a lecture, uh, but a discussion um, in the, what is now the City Art Gallery, then was the Carnegie Free Library and Museum. And a little bit like that first image I showed you, uh, there's a kind of Catholic overtone here in terms of the Hiberno-Romanesque architecture that you see attached on to a civic building. It's one of the few examples of this in Ireland where a Christian style of architecture appears on a secular building. Um, and Boyce is posed to go in and give a discussion um, uh, in the space inside. So this is again around the time of his um, presentations of the exhibitions in Belfast and in Dublin. Uh, and Oliver Dowling, uh, who I think should be acknowledged as the first visual art, the, the curator of contemporary art in the country, organized um, uh, a, a tour where he went to Cork and Limerick and of course gave a talk in Dublin as well. We'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff Oliver told me a little later on. Um, here's how the talk was uh, described in Caroline Tisdale's book. Uh, the audience for the talk, Boyce had just opened the show in the Guggenheim about two months earlier. He was in Limerick that night. The audience was two nuns and a passerby. The blackboard was erased by the porter on completion. I said, why have you dragged me off to the ends of the earth? Fame in the art world only extends so far. So you know, I was a young artist researching this in my 20s. Thought this was pretty juicy, you know, uh, this kind of notion of a very important artist at the time coming to your hometown. So I started asking around a little bit and something started occurring that because it was Limerick on an evening, there wasn't very much to be doing, only going to the Joseph Boyce talk. And it was very well attended. Perhaps there was two nuns and a passerby there for sure, but a lot of the art college crammed in there and the discussion occurred. So again, like how myths kind of come by or how memories can kind of create labels like this, you know? If you're on the road every day as an artist doing gig after gig, uh, you only remember the memory you had of the last time. There are memories of memories of memories. And what was interesting in Limerick was um, to understand how this kind of came out in the report or in the book with Violet Editions in the 1990s. Um, I wrote to Oliver in 2007. He's very generous with his knowledge about his recollections at the time. And there was two emails that uh, he wrote to me that subsequently were presented in this installation that you see here. It's an installed shot from the Gluxman, a uh, show that uh, Rene Zecklin and Matt Packer curated called Overtake, Reinterpretation of Modern Art that was presented in the gallery, I think in the summer of 2007. Uh, so to talk you through a couple of things here, uh, you see on the walls, these two emails from Oliver, uh, a very large printed out photograph of by standing by that door. And then you can see the lettering above the door, Carnegie Free Library and Museum. That had to be removed when the gallery took over the entire complex there because there was no longer a library around the place. So the lettering is so beautiful. They've kept it in a box in the gallery since. And I realized that I could spell Boyce out of the lettering. And so you can see that kind of falling out of the photograph onto the wall and in turn the leftover letters like a game of Scrabble or something on the ground there. Um, you can kind of get a sense of the fine craftsmanship of those letters. Again, coming again, a kind of friction here because you're looking at um, um, whoever made these letters back in Limerick were part of the ornamental school in the early 1900s, what is now the art school, and they were artisans, they weren't artists. So you kind of get that friction about learning things off by heart and having a job and a vocation out of it. Um, uh, that can be compared to those lines I mentioned earlier about Boyce. On leaving Dublin, he asked me to stop and he went into a shop 
and came out with two bales of briquettes and some packets of butter into his hotel in Cork and then back into the car the next morning. The first peat and butter sculptures were made in my car on the journey from Cork back to Dublin and he was delighted with himself. He'd obviously been experimenting in the hotel rooms. He inscribed two of them to me, Oliver recalls. So this was part of the work, of course, the joy of reconstructing something like this and the tactileness of entering in to a sculpture medium that Weiss was involved in. Also a few things to mention about the blackboards in Limerick. Um, Oliver recalled, Weiss said he gave talks, he never gave talks, but he would be happy to have discussions. So that's what was arranged. He asked for at least two freestanding blackboards for each discussion. We managed with great difficulty to find three for Dublin, as it was just at a time when wall blackboards were being introduced. As you know, the Municipal Gallery in Limerick was the host venue, and Miss Lanigan, the librarian curator, agreed. And Mr. Andrews was assistant in, an assistant in the gallery. When we arrived, we discovered they could not find any blackboards. It was eventually agreed that a large black table present could be turned on its side and Boyce used it to illustrate his discussion. It worked well. Boyce usually left his blackboards with the gallery, but this table had to be cleaned as it was needed for practical purposes in the gallery the next day. So again, these are the vernacularisms and everyday nature of things coming down on these scenarios. Um, uh, in Belfast, uh, this is some material uh, generated by my very close friend, John Carson, who was a student uh, in the Belfast Art College when Joseph Boyce visited. Here you see him on the front page of issue three of uh, the Art College magazine. It didn't have a name. It would always just be a numerical uh, title. Uh, and already the puns have began, a boy's crying in the wilderness. Uh, and inside, this is some of the editorial material John was around uh, shepherding together. First of all, Boyce landing in Carrick Fergus after his historic crossing of Belfast Lock in 1960. Um, and then uh, an editorial describing the scene in the art college at that time when somebody had made a banner saying, welcome William de Kooning, and then crossed it out and said de Boyce. So um, the great excitement about the presence of someone there, but also already the jokes and the glossolalia and the possibility of speaking in tongues is becoming infectious within the artistic community there, even before Boyce arrives on the site. Um, this is another contribution John made for a magazine called IED that was made in Belfast at the time. Um, uh, so to break it down a little bit, there's a formal introduction on the left-hand side of some of Boyce's ideas. Then there's speech bubbles on the right there, him direct quotes that were taken from the lecture he gave in Belfast. As you can see, he appeared as a two-headed beast at the talk there. Um, and then underneath the table are a selection, I suppose, a vox pop we'd know it as, uh, of different uh, things that John overheard at the talk in the Ulster Museum, and also uh, expressions that had been heard in the art school corridors and around town during the week of Weiss's visit there. Um, there's the double-headed voice. Uh, and I just want to detail a few of the quotations out of celebration and joy, I suppose, of how people engaged with this particular uh, visit to the city. Um, what Mr. Boyce is saying sounds suspiciously like anarchy. A breath of fresh air, here's one well-known artist person who is completely honest and open. God help our wee country. They're coming from everywhere to pick the bones off the carcass. I think that's a reference to the influx of foreign journalists into the troubles at that time. Joseph Weiss did attempt to change the Northern Ireland situation for the better, 
which is as much as if not more than some of us are doing. Uh, I'd like to move to Cork. Uh, here's the Crawford Art Gallery. You can see, and it's photographed by Caroline Tisdale. Uh, you can see in the foreground some of the Irish energies, the turf sandwiches, as they're known as a little bit on the table and vice riffing away there. Here's another image of, um, I don't know the name of, of the, the, the man here, but he was um, associated with the Art College and the, the Crawford Gallery at the time. And he rubbed out uh, the blackboards at the end of the lecture. Um, I got talking about this to somebody about a year or two after I'd made the piece in Limerick and showed it in Cork. And they said to me, listen, I was at the lecture and uh, I went up to the blackboard afterwards and there was some of the chalk dust uh, around it. And I scooped up all the chalk dust and I put it in um, a little medicine container and I've been taking it around with me a good bit over the decade since. Um, would you like to have a look at that, Sean? And I was quite excited, of course. It was at a time, especially when I was thinking about the value of relics and um, also how museumological processes go and thinking about speeding up certain things, you know, that um, museums or that process of collecting or being aware and uncovering things could be accelerated through some of the art projects I was making at that stage. Uh, so this is, it's really difficult to photograph a tiny piece of chalk dust, you know. This is the first attempt we did with a 5.4 camera and it's kind of modest enough, like you wouldn't really know what you're looking at, I suppose, in some way. Um, and then eventually we got a better camera and bellows and got to photograph the chalk with, I suppose, a bit more panache or something along those lines. And the image was then blown up and was stuck onto a billboard that I had made for, this is the National Sculpture Factory in Cork on Albert Road. Uh, it's kind of a pretty archetypical image of the site. It's a very busy road in front of it. Um, and it was placed there, um, I think, maybe for nine months or a year or something like that. Um, yeah, it didn't get too great a reception, really. I suppose, you know, if you're looking at something that looks like an advertising hoarding, you'd expect a bit more explanation than a pile of some white substance on the side of the road. Um, some people thought it was cocaine. I was kind of thinking, fair enough, like, I don't know that much about cocaine. Someone then told me it's hardly cocaine because cocaine is fine more, I've never taken cocaine, but it's more finely cut if you're going to take it rather than these kind of blobby bits that you see in the foreground there of the image. Um, and at the bottom, there was like a label, like you'd find it in a gallery or a museum uh, describing what it was. But, um, you know, if you were driving by in the car all the time, it still was a mystery object. And I kind of thought that that was part of the project. And the man who gave me the chalk, he was saying, you can't tell anyone it's me, Sean, you know. Um, so generally people thought I was making the whole thing up, that it was some tidy story or something like that that came out of my head. Um, but I kept going anyway, and I convinced Danny McCarthy to come out and uh, take possession of his role as someone that was incredibly aware of that evening in Cork and knew that there was a great value in that chalk dust to hold that as a relic and for it to nurture not only him, but other people around him and performance art and understandings of fluxist uh, movements in Ireland and abroad for a long time after that. So I did curated a show in the Crawford in 2012 and Danny proposed that he would uh, take the chalk dust and sprinkle it one day all over the gallery and take some photographs of where it was left and reintroduce it back to its site. In my mind, it was a very shamanistic act and uh, also had a a beautiful sense of the latency of history, that something was there 
disappeared and somehow came back to the site again to imbue it with another element of this particular understanding of what's possible and how we relate to the world. So here are some of the photographs of Danny's. It's kind of, I think there's some of the chalk dust in the background on the left hand side. He, he might be able to point it out later or, you know, on the stairwell of the gallery too, he sprinkled these and took these photographs of evidence that in my mind are very, very beautiful. And I always love when artists make work inside in galleries. I think that's a particular idiom that I'm very interested in. So it was a great old journey and we had a great time talking to each other about these moments and how we progressed that history together, Danny and I. Um, want to, this is an image from the front page of uh, the Irish Times. Uh, in 1977. Um, it's one of the blackboards that, of course, is present in the gallery's collection to this day. A um, couple of things. Um, the blackboards were in storage for about three years until the curator, Edna Waldron, decided to put them on display in the foyer coming into the gallery. Um, I'm going to read a little bit, a small bit of writing I've done on this. Uh, the display of blackboards caused some consternation at the meeting of the Cultural Committee of Dublin Corporation. The committee's concerns hinged both on the eligibility of the blackboards as works of art and also the difficulties of conservation of delicate chalk drawings. Councillor PJ O'Mahony said, I have seen the piece of alleged art. If a piece had been rubbed out and a child added chalk marks to it, I doubt if the artist would know it. Councillor Alice Glenn declared, I believe a man has to watch it all the time because kids are coming in from school and rubbing bits out and adding new bits. The committee called for the immediate removal of the blackboards, but Dublin city manager JP Malloy refused their requests and the blackboards remained on show. Um, Here's a little report, a little time after that, that the school uh, might be asking for the blackboards back. And um, of course, there's going to be a negotiation about that uh, on, on the basis of some of that scandal and everything else. Uh, the newspapers, again, the vernacularism of the everyday and the comment and everything become appear, become, begin to appear. Jim Murphy, a sixth year student in Ross Gray, uh, would surely have had a good career in art criticism if he kept writing articles with such uh, uh, polemic in them. Uh, he's very concerned that they're an embarrassing eyesore from the sight of the public and uh, especially for the hard fought for, uh, an, uh, sorry, please will someone enter this gallery brandishing a duster and quickly erase this embarrassing eyesore from the sight of the public and the hard fought for foreign tourists. Um, so, um, of course, boys would enjoy this, you know, kids getting very uh, into the nature of the radical changes that would be ahead in his philosophy. And boys, oh boys, P. Healy and Dublin trade should be noted in the letters to the editor's page as well. Um, just want to mention um, a couple of other artists and kinships, I suppose, that I've shared over the last years, sharing some of this material with different people and enjoying conversations about trying to understand uh, more thorough meaning and what it is in a contemporary world. Uh, this is an artist called James Mansfield, um, and he's been working in uh, Connemara in the summers for uh, several years now, uh, reimagining or imagining a scenario where Boyce would have made it to Connemara. And so this is a sculpture James has made called Fat Triangle. And uh, it's an ephemeral work, as you can see on the stones there. And some of the most um, beautiful things I've seen in terms of printed matter over the last years are some of the pamphlets that James has been making uh, at the end of each summer. And so here he's uh, 
beginning to disassemble um, a geological, um, a strict geological understanding of the stones and rocks uh, that you see there and introduce them into a Boycian logic. Uh, again, a kind of foundational aspect to moving on and changing our understandings of the world around. And you can see on the bottom on the right, imaginative research is a particular descriptive he has there. And one other piece I really want to share that just knocked the socks off me when I saw it was Nevin Lehart's exhibition in the RHA Gallery in uh, 2010. And the title of this work is Boyce Times Tables, Revised Edition. And somehow Nevin managed to take all these um, ideas of the individual and society and our, our actions within it and uh, um, compress it down to these words here uh, on the blackboard with a paper mache head of Joseph Bice conducting the words into some sort of order. And for me, it was one of the most incredible pieces to see of Nevins and it's always stuck with me since. Um, so there you are. I mean, there's a kind of this notion of the pragmatism and like the fantasy putting up against each other in, in these talks or conversations or situations around vice. It's quite a white gambit. And I think it's also has a sense of being able to nourish certain moments that we're in and how we live our lives. And these are a couple of the things that I've learned over or discovered or had the joy of sharing with other people over the last few years. And again, I'm happy to share it and let's hope it leads us to interesting places into the future. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>